this morning we're going to look at when is it okay to agree, to disagree, and continue to move forward. As we mentioned earlier, Charlie and Jan Byer celebrating 50 years together. Uh, I'm sure that there have been times in their marriage where they had a disagreement and they stayed together and they agreed to disagree. I hope Chrissy and I get 50 years together plus, and we have disagreements at times. And there are times where you learn how to agree to disagree, but it seems like that sometimes we have trouble in the church. So we're gonna look at Acts 15 this morning and talk about that. Uh, first, I wanna share just a, a little bit of, from a pastor I heard this week. Someone sent me a link, I think it was Kevin Myers at 12 Stones Church. Uh, wasn't really familiar with him, but this uh, in his sermon, he said some things that I want to share with you. And it was a sermon he preached in September of 2020. And uh, he's talking about how there's so many voices trying to tell him how to lead. And then he gives these literal examples uh, that I'm going to share with you. And I can certainly relate to every one of these. One of his examples, he said, someone sent an email. They said, I'm leaving because you didn't open the church fast enough. And he said, how many people do you want to leave the church? And then he got another letter that says, I'm leaving because you opened the church too fast. Got another one that said, I'm leaving if you don't mandate masks. And another one that said, I'm leaving because you are mandating masks. The list goes on and on. He has a, a, several more relatable illustrations political and racial illustrations where just the tensions of 2020, uh, everyone had an opinion. And then he said, uh, in the past six months, I've experienced more hostility than any other time in my 32 years of ministry. And I can relate. It is a very opinionated and tension heavy environment that has bled into all areas of society. He said this, the world takes its cues from the culture, but I take my cues from Christ. And then I love what he said next. He said, I'm not mad. I'm just on mission. And then he appealed not to send him letters of what other pastors are doing. And I can resonate with that as well. Um, and I bet many of you can resonate with whatever job you're in from getting bombarded with different opinions about how things should happen. And then there's times that just, you're just so frustrated about somebody else's point of view. And sometimes you get to the point to where like, I can't work with that person. I can't interact with that person anymore because it's going to be hostile. So how do you get to the point to where you recognize when you can and should work with someone or when you say, no, I can't, I'm just on such a different page. When can you say, all right, I'm just leaving, I'm out? Or when is it okay to agree to disagree and move forward? That's what we're going to look at this morning in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 15. Acts, we said on the surface level, it's how the Holy Spirit uh, works through the apostles. It's the acts of the apostles. It's the work that the followers of Christ did through the power of the Holy Spirit. And many times we see the acts uh, as they're in power and as they're doing the miraculous, preaching the gospel, People are being healed. They're overcoming persecution. There are times where there are people are being stoned in the church. There are people that are uh, just being isolated or ostracized by society. There was a lot of external threats to the church in the book of Acts. But probably the most frustrating part for the church, and, and I would say for, for me as a Christian, is when the threats are internal when the tension is internal, when it comes from within, when other arguments among the people within the church and disagreements. And so in Acts 15, you're going to see Paul and Barnabas. They had just returned from their first missionary journey. God had done miraculous things to reach the Gentiles. They come back to an argument, if you will, or a meeting at Jerusalem to determine uh, how they should move forward. They come to the conclusion that they... They compromise, in a sense, to figure out the best way to uh, not offend or create a stumbling block to the Jewish believers, as well as to be effective at communicating to the Gentile believers is by God's grace alone. And they, they establish the direction they want to take, and they're getting ready to set off for the second missionary journey. 
And this happens in Acts 15, starting at verse 36. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought it was best not to take with them the one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement, so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Sicilia, Sicilia uh, strengthening the churches. So what has happened here is you've got Paul and Barnabas, they're getting ready to go do a second missionary journey together. And Barnabas is like, hey, he's got his cousin here, Mark, that he wants to take with him on the journey. And Paul's like, hold up, time out. There is no way we're going to take Mark on this journey. And Barnabas is like, if we don't take Mark, I'm not going. And Paul's like, fine, you all go do your thing. I'll take Silas. So Paul and Silas go one direction to do the mission. And Barnabas and Mark go a different direction to do the mission. And just want to point out that this wasn't just a small disagreement. The Greek word perusimus, this, this, it means that it was an, an incitement, this irritation. There was an emotional anger behind this decision. That They were literally, this sharp, uh, sharp dissension between them was literally filled with emotion, anger, and uh, this animosity towards one another. And think about it, these were two godly men that could not come to terms with whether or not Mark should go or stay. And they were such strong disagreement that they chose to not go on the mission together, but rather to separate. Now, thankfully, and I think one of the main things for us to learn is that they both stayed on mission. Actually, uh, twice the work was done as a result of it. But the questions that I want us to ponder today, think about, is first is who are these men? We're going to unpack that. And then I want to talk about what made them disagree. And then I want to ask the question is when should we part with other believers? So it's kind of the, the who, what, and when. Who are these believers? Uh, what made them disagree? And when should we part ways with other believers? So let's talk about who these men were. First of all, Silas and Barnabas, uh, they were leaders in the church. Uh, these were men who were respected. Elders, remember Barnabas sold land to plant the, the first church. These were pillars of the first established church in Christianity. They were respected. Uh, Barnabas, when they were looking for direction, went all the way to Tarsus to get Paul just to bring him back and then went on a missionary journey with him. These guys were very respected men. And Paul, let's talk about him. Who is Paul? Paul was this man. He wrote most of the books in the Bible, in the New Testament. So when you think about Paul, there's probably no one single person other than Jesus who's contributed more to the evangelism of the known world than Paul. I mean, he wrote most of the New Testament. He does these missionary journeys. He's an educated man. He was a Pharisee. Uh, before his conversion, and then his conversion, there's, there's no other conversion in history that has probably caused more skeptics to become Christians than Paul's conversion story. Uh, and the Bible continually mentioned through the book of Acts that he's filled with the Holy Spirit, that this just isn't a smart, educated man. This is a spirit-filled man surrendered to God, and God's doing an amazing work in his life. So you've got these two pillars of the church, elders, and then you've got uh, Paul, who is this godly, spirit-filled man, and then you've got Mark. Mark must be the weakest link, right? Well, let's talk about who Mark is for a minute. Mark, he traveled with Paul. He bailed on the first missionary journey. He left partway through it, and he's now going to do another missionary journey with Barnabas. The interesting thing about Mark is I don't believe, when I think, think about this for a minute, I don't know of any other person 
in history that rubbed shoulders with more godly men than Mark. He hung out with Paul and Barnabas. He hung out with Silas. He hung out with Jesus and the 12 disciples. The first gospel written, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Mark's gospel, that's right, it was written by this Mark that we're talking about, the person who wrote the first gospel. Uh, in 1 Peter 5.13, Peter talks about Mark. He's, he calls him his son. So clearly, Mark got to hang out with Peter, you know, the right-hand man, if you will, of Jesus, to disciple him, to pour into him. And then he gets to hang out with Paul. He literally hung out with Jesus. As a matter of fact, one of the interesting stories in Mark, I, I love Mark's gospel for many reasons. It's, it's the shortest. It's succinct. It just it leaves out the details and just tells you the kind of the main story. But in Mark 14, when Jesus is praying in the garden and he's arrested and the disciples flee, it has this interesting story. 14 verse 51 says this, And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him. But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Now, okay, it's like, thanks, Mark, Mark for that detail. Most scholars believe this was actually Mark they're talking about in the garden. And, and I believe all scripture is God-breathed. It's inspired by God. But don't you find this ironic that someone who left out all the other details that Mark and Luke seem to add to their gospels, Mark doesn't include those details, but yet he has these two verses in there that, oh yeah, when Jesus got arrested, there was this guy who ran away. They grabbed him, but they left his, left his clothes and he runs away naked. And so I don't know why that verse is in there. Those two verses are in there. Other than to say, Mark is perhaps quirky, unique, special. I, I don't know. Perhaps it's illustrating that he's a runner. That he's He leaves when things get... I don't know. I have no clue why those verses are in the Bible. But they are in there. And I share those to help us understand who these men are. Because sometimes I think we have a tendency to, to not um, humanize people, to not think about them uh, in the right light. Uh, some of us have this view of certain people that they can do no wrong. And part of adulthood is understanding the good-bad split. Uh, I, I took an African-American history class when I was in college because I wanted to understand more about uh, culture and things that uh, African Americans have gone through. And it was a very insightful class. It was interesting. And a few years later, I'd read uh, one, actually one of my favorite leadership books was the autobiography of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I was so impressed at the man's character, his integrity, the man's passion and conviction, the work that he did for the civil rights movement was was amazing and i considered him one of my heroes i really was i remember writing a bunch of stuff on facebook years ago in, in uh, like 2006 or something like that about how uh, this book had influenced my life and how he was such a such a great man and uh after finishing the book I started doing a little more research and i learned that some of the colleagues of his that followed around had all these stories about how um he wasn't faithful to his wife and how that he had they'd done interviews claiming that that yeah they had witnessed extramarital affairs and all these things and i remember being devastated and i'm like are, are you serious i literally was ignorant uh to these details because they were not in the autobiography and i was shocked to find out kind of the negative side of his life and um it made me think, it made me think about how devastated some people are when they put certain people on a pedestal, think of them as all good, and then they're, they're crushed or either disbelief when they do something bad. Uh, when we have a view that someone is all good or even all bad, it really does create an unrealistic expectation of that person. So let me help make sure we're not putting someone in a good, bad split where they're all good or all bad. Think about the person right now that you love and respect more than anybody else. Got, got that person in your mind? 
The truth is that person, whoever he or she may be, they are fallible. They're imperfect. They have struggles. They have sin. Now do this. Think about the evilest person you can think of that's alive today. That person is created in God's image and has the ability to exhibit certain attributes of God. And because of that alone, has is an entitled a certain degree of respect. And we have a tendency today to treat certain people as if they're all good or all bad. And here's the other thing to remember. Not only do we interact with imperfect people, we are one. We are imperfect. We are fallible people. Therefore, we will always have disagreements and we need to learn how to deal with those. So, these are great men of God and they're having disagreements so sharp, such tension that they cannot come to a conclusion and they literally go their own separate ways. So what are the disagreements here? So most, most commentaries or sermons that I've listened to suggest that Mark probably did something negative, that there was more behind the scenes than, uh, than you would expect. Um, I've typically heard things like, Mark, Mark didn't count the cost. When he got on there, he got homesick. He's like, I can't, I can't do this. I thought I could. I got homesick. Uh, perhaps he did not resonate, resonate with Paul's leadership. Maybe he was used to his, you know, he was Barnabas's cousin and he thought, you know, I'm used to Barnabas's leadership and now Paul seems to be in charge and I don't like it. I don't like taking orders from him, personality conflicts, whatever. And he went back. Uh, some scholars think that Mark was the one who caused the conflict in the Jerusalem council. Perhaps he was like, because it's interesting because Mark leaves right after um, Sergius Paulus, the Roman proconsul, becomes a, a convert. And perhaps Mark had a trouble with that and went back to Jerusalem and said, he's not preaching in the synagogues like he was supposed to, because that's what he typically did. But he went to a Gentile Roman proconsul and led him to Christ. And what became the debate when he got back from his missionary journey was, do the Gentiles need to become Jewish or is it by grace alone? And perhaps Mark or Paul was blaming Mark for all the conflict that happened because he kind of went and tattled, so to speak. Don't know. Perhaps it's positive. You know, I don't hear many of these as options, but... I think it could be. It could be that uh, what if God simply called Mark to a different direction while he was on that mission? I mean, because when Paul does the second missionary journey, we're going to see that Jesus, uh, the Holy Spirit, calls uh, Paul to do that, to take a different direction than what he had planned on going. So maybe that happened with Mark. And Paul didn't get memo. Perhaps it was during this time that, you know, Mark said, I need to write a book of the account from my time hanging out with Peter. And he wrote the Gospel of Mark during this time. I, I, don't, I don't know. And the bottom line is the Bible doesn't say what caused this tension. The Bible doesn't tell us why Mark left. And I believe this. I believe the Bible was very intentional with everything that's in there as well as what is not in here. And I think that the Bible doesn't want us to spend all of our time speculating what Mark did or didn't do, but rather how to move forward. In other words, the author Luke doesn't seem as concerned with clarifying if Paul or Barnabas was right, but rather uh, how they move forward to stay on mission. So I will say this. I want to say this. In the last letter that Paul wrote in his life, he wraps up the letter with this. 2 Timothy 4.11, it's this beautiful verse. You may not have caught this if you were just reading it, but, but listen to this. Paul says, Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. So there was a work of reconciliation uh, through the maturity and the newfound perspective that Paul had to work with Mark again. Again, we don't know all the details, but even Paul... Even Mark, these great men of faith were in process. And we see this uh, relationship reconciled uh, before 
the end of Paul's life. So uh, there are times as well, I would say, that our arguments escalate to we don't, we don't even know why we're mad anymore. And I know definitely in doing marriage counseling with folks that sometimes they just, the argument escalated so much that you just shove someone into that camp of all bad. You shove someone else into the camp of all good or whatever, and you leave them there. And then you hear everything they say with a distorted perspective. And we need to be on guard. So here's the question that I want to close with is when should we part ways from other believers? When, when do we say, all right, we need to divide. And when I went, my first seminary class was in 1999. And uh, I learned this system that I've used. I've heard other systems since then, but this was a system I learned was convictions, beliefs, and opinions. And it categorized my beliefs into these three categories. And convictions were beliefs that I believe so strongly about that if they, if they were altered in some way or distorted, it would affect salvation. In other words, if someone said, like I hold that Jesus is the only way as a conviction level belief. That there, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I hold that as a conviction level belief. If you have a different view, we would have a problem with me calling you a Christian if you think there's another way to experience God other than through the person of Jesus Christ. I hold that this Bible is the word of God and the truth as a conviction level belief. Uh, that the body of believers make up the body of Christ. There are several things that I hold as conviction level beliefs that I believe very strongly and would think it necessary to break fellowship even with someone who would differ from those views. Then there are beliefs. Now, beliefs are things that I can believe just as strongly as convictions, but wouldn't necessarily break fellowship over. There were things like, there's like uh, different views on speaking in tongues or forms of baptism or uh premillennial versus amillennial uh, uh, and eschatology. And I have my views on these issues, but if you had a different view, I could still say, well, you're my brother or sister in Christ. I wouldn't break fellowship. And then there, there, then there are opinions and opinions are just that it's the, we should be in person right now. No, we should stay online. We should wear a mask. We shouldn't wear a mask. You should dress up. You should dress down their opinions. And I think that, Oftentimes, uh, in my experience anyway with Christians, that we fight over opinions more than we do spending our time and energy developing convictions and establishing our beliefs. And uh, I think that we need to, to kind of switch that a little bit. I've also heard a few years ago another, um, another system that goes over top of that con convictions, beliefs, and opinions. And I don't remember where I heard this from. It was so long ago that I that I wrote it down and I'd give credit to whoever it was, but I don't remember who first said it. I don't remember uh, if it was a teacher or a book or, or what, but uh, I didn't come up with this system, but, but it was this. Uh, identify what you would die for, divide for, debate for, and decide for. And the first two deal with orthodoxy, you know, what your beliefs is, uh, beliefs are, and the second two are orthopraxy. Praxy, what, what you do with that. So identifying what you would die for. And I think as a church, we need to identify the things that we should die for. Matter of fact, in the, I think we're in the last days and I think that we better be prepared to be willing to die for our faith, to be martyred for our faith. Uh, when I was a teenager, I think I was 18, I learned these four things about depression and anxiety that that people that are dealing with depression and anxiety need a self to live with. In other words, they need to be able to look in the mirror and like what they see. They need a self to live with. They need uh, a faith to live by. They need a goal to live for. And then they need something worth dying for. Something that they're so passionate about. Like, like a single mom can go through extraordinary difficult things, but they're willing to die for their kids. So that will motivate them to, to rise above even anxiety and depression to move forward. So this importance of having convictions that are worth dying for are very important. And I would say this, um, if you have check, checklist Christianity, in other words, if your faith isn't a relationship, but is a list of checklists, then I doubt you have a growing relationship with God. 
Making God a priority in every area of your life is what will cause you to have a growing relationship with God. Making a checklist a part of your Christian experience will probably turn you into a legalistic Pharisee. But we need to develop growing relationship with God, having something in our convictions worth dying for. Another thing is within that, within the belief system, I think there's two categories, what you would divide for, what you would debate for. Divide for, I think that you need to figure these out. Uh, Clearly, there's a situation between Mark and Paul in this passage that they were willing to divide for. Um, Perhaps Paul later realized he was the one that was wrong, and that's why he's given Mark another chance. I, I don't know. I do know that if we don't have our convictions decided, if we don't know where we're willing to draw the line in our own life, that we'll cross the line of our convictions. Remember when I was a teenager uh, looking at Daniel 1.8, and Daniel purposed in his heart not to eat the portion of the king's meat. In other words, he didn't compromise uh, this diet as it relates to, it was it was related to adultery and he, did, and he wanted to serve God. And so he drew this line that I'm not going to do this thing. And I started asking myself at a young age, where's the, where are the lines that I'm going to draw and say, I am not, I'm not going to end up in a place where I'm going to become, become like an alcoholic or I'm not going to end up in a place where I'm financially here. I'm not going to end up in a place. And so I have to draw the lines of conviction and say, uh, I, I'm not going to cross those lines. But we have to decide what we would divide for. And, and I'll say this. God help us if in the 21st century, Christians let masks, politics, or personal preferences draw the lines for us. The next area is the things that we debate for. I have a premillennial view of eschatology, return of Christ. I have friends that have amillennial views. And we can debate back and forth, and at the end of the day, we can disagree but I would not break fellowship with those believers, but we can debate some of those issues. Uh, and I'm someone, I don't want to just discuss an issue that, that's head knowledge. I think we can get caught up in the head knowledge stuff, but we also need to focus on application. What does knowledge produce in our life? Uh, because sometimes knowledge can just produce pride if we don't have humility and application tethered to it. But, but what do we debate for and what do we decide for? Uh, and I'll say this, and this is the key as I wrap up. The decision should lead you to stay on mission. And this is what Paul, Barnabas, Silas, and Mark got right. They decided if they could not, if they needed to divide, they debated, they couldn't get it figured out, that they were still, they decided that they would stay on mission. Uh, And so the question that I want to leave you with is where are you going to serve the Lord? Whatever we're going to have disagreements with one another on issues. I'm more concerned with, all right, you might need to divide over this or that, but, but where are you going to serve the Lord? Do the decisions you make show that you love God and love others well, because that's what we are called to do. And I pray and trust that during this season that we'll do that. We pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for who you are. God, we confess that we are fallible. As Romans says, let God be true and every man a liar. That we get things mixed up at times. The reason you came to this earth is because we are fallible, messed up people in need of a Savior. So we recognize that you are the way. You are the truth. You are the life. We place our faith in you and we pray that you would give us wisdom and how to know when to agree to disagree and move forward together and not be a part of creating division, especially in your body, but being unified so that mission gets accomplished. Pray these things in Jesus' holy name.